We know that this is uh, the week of midterm, so uh, we will finish on time, so you can go and prepare to tomorrow's or, or Friday's midterms. Um, so today is an interesting experiment um, uh, of, dia of open dialogue with ECP, and we'll tell you in a second how it works. Uh, but let me first uh, introduce Benoit Curé. Uh, Benoit Curé is uh, probably uh, the, how would I say it? the heavyweight economist on the board of the European Central Bank. Benoit uh, is from Grenoble in France and uh, did uh, Ecole Polytechnique. And from Ecole Polytechnique, uh, he worked in the French Treasury as first as chief economist economic advisor at the Treasury, and later as the person in charge of the Agence France Trésor, which is the agency that issues and manages French debt. Then uh, he moved to the ECB in January 2012, if I remember right, and he has been responsible for the operations of the European Central Bank in an important period, because you know the ECB has done a lot on markets recently. Um, and, but he has also had time to write books, so there is a book which we published, which Bocconi published a few years ago. Uh, it, the book is interesting because the original is, is with uh, Agnès uh, Benassicoré, who is a French economist. The original title in French was uh, L'économie de l'euro, the economics of the euro. But then in the Italian translation, is l'euro della discordia. I don't know how you translate it in English, so it was a, <laughs> it was a successful book. And then there is also a, a textbook in economic policy published by Mulino a couple of uh, years later, so Benoit also had the time to do it. So today is about um, what Europe can do for you, for your generation, um, is is a dialogue, so you're going to ask questions, so you should think about them, but also many other people uh, around uh, Europe, at least, of the world, are asking questions, and I let Professor Monacelli describe the complicated way in which we're going to manage this. So I don't think it's going to be, uh, so good evening, first of all, everyone. Uh, so as Francesco suggested, we, we thought uh, about doing this in the form of a dialogue uh, through which you can uh, actually submit questions directly. Um, if you have a question for uh, Benoit Coré, uh, you can either raise your hand, okay, directly, or you can go to a website that is called, uh, that it's called uh, Slido, okay, um, S-L-I-D-O, I think you can view this here. Okay, so the, uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, requested, you can vote uh, uh, on other people's uh, questions as well. So the most voted questions will, uh, will pop up on the screen. So you have to log on to, uh, to slido.com and then you can enter this uh, uh, code, uh, hashtag L066. Okay. Uh, Yes, you can see it here. And so you can si simply submit your question there. Uh, you can vote on other people's question. The top three questions will be seen on the screen and I will sort of uh, uh, then submit the questions to Benoit Coré. Okay, I hope this is clear. Okay, so you can uh, 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 submit your questions uh, directly or vote on other, on other people's uh, questions. So log on to slido.com and, and simply enter the code L066. Okay. Okay. So now we can leave the, the floor to yes. and so, welcome uh, Benoit Correct. Benoit is going to start with an introduction, maybe 20 minutes, and he has some slides, and which will give you time to think about questions. So, <clears throat> so good evening, everyone, and I would like to thank very much uh, the university, and particularly uh, Francesco and Tommaso, for the uh, invitation and for and to thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'll try not to be too long. Uh, I would like to thank also Francesco for his kind uh, introduction. Uh, even though the change of title between French and Italian probably tells you more about Italy than about the authors of the book, but okay, that's a discussion we can have. Um, we, um, 
Uh, just to set the, the, the stage for that discussion, I've uh, tried to take the, uh, the theme here, the title seriously, at face value, what Europe can do for you, and I've prepared a few, uh, a few, a few thoughts on uh, how um, economic conditions for the, for the youth, for the younger generations, have changed recently in Europe with the crisis, uh, but also with the structural factors that, are, that go beyond the EU and beyond the crisis, uh, and uh, what Europe can do about it, just to, uh, to take the, the theme of the discussion seriously. And then we can have a discussion on anything else, uh, including monetary policy. If you're interested in monetary policy, I'd be happy to answer, uh, but also on the, on the EU uh, more broadly. Uh, and so the, the few slides I'm going to show you are about how to how, how, how the younger generations can reap the benefits of, of Europe uh, uh, better. And you will see that there are many challenges. So I will start with the challenges, the, the dark side of it. Uh, and uh, I will offer a few, uh, a few solutions. And so to start with the challenges, um, I think that first slide uh, uh, outlines the challenges quite well. That's about the uh, uh, living standard for different generations, so it's real GDP per capita, it's, it's, it's here, it's in Italy, it would probably not be substantially different in any other country, so, but I took Italy because we're in Italy here, uh, and that's real GDP per capita uh, as broken down by generations, for different generations, and um, so it's a stylized fact if you want, and it's quite striking, you see that uh, starting with the generations uh, born uh, at, the, um, at the turn of the last century, so early 20th century, which is the yellow line here, the bottom yellow line, you see that living, st living standards have uh, steadily increased uh, for every generation, the yellow generation, the blue generation, the green generation, uh, the dark blue generation, uh, which was born between 1966 and, and 1980. And then you have the, the latest generation here, born between 1981 and 2000, so let's call it the millennials, or well, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but uh, anyone born between 1980 and 2000. And you can see that the first time you have a generation which is at risk of uh, breaking with the trend and uh, not benefiting from the same uh, tide in terms of, of uh, uh, steadily increasing living standards. So there is something that is broken here. And so that immediately beats the question, which is what, in, what has to do with Europe here, or what, what would be uh, something that you would see more globally? Uh, and what, uh, what, uh, what can EU institutions in particular do, uh, do about it? And uh, just to give you another uh, illustration, or maybe to dig deeper into that discussion, uh, here you have another stylized fact, which is uh, how much uh, household uh, disposable income has increased uh, between uh, 1980 and 2010, so over a period of 30 years in different places, UK, Canada, etc. Uh, but again, it's broken down by generation. And you can see that the uh, income growth for the younger generation, aged uh, uh, 25, 29 here, uh, has been uh, actually negative compared to the average. So, so uh, disposable income has grown by less than average for the younger generation, and it has grown by more than average for uh, the uh, older uh, generations here, the uh, 65, 69, and 70, uh, 74. So that's another illustration of the inequality in uh, the distribution of income across generations, uh, which is not something that is, that is so often uh, looked at. Um, so um, the, uh, why does it matter? Well, it does matter because uh, if there is a sense that uh, the distribution of income is so unequal across generations, it creates a risk that uh, the younger generation will, uh, uh, will lose uh, um, uh, support for Europe, or that Europe would lose support across the, uh, among the younger generations. And that really creates a risk of a, of a, of a kind of negative doom, doom loop. European institutions need to be supported, they need to be democratically accountable, obviously, they need to be, to be trusted, they need to be, to be supported in order to deliver what they have to deliver. That in includes the ECB, but any other European institution. And uh, if uh, there is a perceived lack of, uh, of uh, performance, of, of delivery uh, of European institutions in distributing income fairly across generations, there is a, a risk of a doom loop where European institutions would, would lose support and would be less in a position to deliver what they have to deliver. And that's the kind of doom loop that we, we really have to avoid today. And the point I'm going to make is that Europe has to act first, 
a lot of it is in your hands, actually, because the future is with you, is not with uh, European institutions uh, uh, run by uh, elderly, uh, elderly uh, 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 bureaucrats. Uh, but for, in order, to, in order to, to fight this doom loop, uh, Europe has to act first and to show in a visible way that we use all instruments to, uh, to distribute income uh, in a fair way across, uh, across generation. Uh, and uh, just to give you one last, uh, one last uh, stylized fact, uh, which is over the, the latest period. Uh, so that's uh, net income since uh, 2009. So it re it's really a focus on the impact of the great financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis. Um, and you can see how the uh, median income has evolved for the younger people uh, across member states. So that's for people aged uh, 16 to 24. It's deflated by, by prices, so it's re real uh, me uh, median income across, uh, across European countries. And you can see that in nearly all EU member states, uh, real median income has actually uh, decreased. It has fell for the younger generation across Europe. And it's only in France and Germany that it has marginally increased uh, and it has decreased. And obviously, you, you can also have a sense here of the impact of the financial crisis. You see that Greece, uh, Spain, Ireland come last. These are countries which have been very heavily impacted by the crisis. So it also tells you that if we want to do something about it, we also have to make uh, our, uh, our macro institutions, in particular the Eurozone, work better to avoid that kind of crisis that has disproportionately impacted uh, the, uh, the younger people. So it's not only about uh, micro issues, structural issues, it's also about, about having good macro, macro policies to avoid uh, uh, seeing that kind of, uh, of, uh, of economic outcomes which have disrupt, disproportionately impacted the younger people. So, um, of course, it's not all bad. Uh, and so if you, if you focus on the left-hand side of that chart, you see that uh, unemployment has uh, went down by quite a lot uh, since... Uh, around 2013, so the turnaround is, is, is about 2013. Uh, in the aggregate, in the Eurozone, uh, around 10 million new jobs have been created since mid-2013. And um, I would, I would uh, argue that monetary policy has been a substantial part of it, not, not the only part of it, but a substantial part of it, by, by lifting uh, aggregate demand. We've also allowed uh, net job creations to come back in, uh, in all European countries. Uh, and, uh, and that shows in, the, uh, in net job creations. That also shows in the unemployment rate, where the unemployment rate at Eurozone level has fell down from 12% in uh, 2013 to a uh, little bit lower than 8% today. So there has been a very substantial decrease in the unemployment rate due to macro policies and uh, also labor market reforms uh, in, uh, in some countries. Uh, but it's always, it's always balanced because on the same slide, you also see that youth unemployment remains twice as, as, as large as uh, average unemployment. So you can see that whatever macro policies have brought in the aggregate uh, has benefited the young people less and uh, the uh, youth unemployment remains uh, twice as, uh, as large as average unemployment across the board uh, in nearly uh, all Eurozone countries. So there, there remains a lot to do here. Um, and uh, what makes it even more worrying, in a sense, is that uh, if you look at the, at the reason why um, the um, uh, unemployment among the young people in Europe has fell, it is not that much because of net job creation. You would expect unemployment to fall because jobs are being created, right? But in the case of the young people, it's not that much because of net job creation. It's also a lot because uh, the labor force has shrinked. Uh, uh, among the youth uh, in Europe. And that reflects a number of factors which are mostly structural factors, which have nothing much to do with the EU or with the Euro or with anything local here. First factor is demography, obviously. The structure of the labor force is changing and the, the proportion of the young, younger labor force is shrinking because of, because of aging, because of demographic change. And that's, that's true everywhere. Second factor is uh, about new technologies. Uh, Digitization is coming, uh, automation, robotization is coming, and an increasing fraction of the younger population uh, has been seeking higher education, uh, so has been studying for longer instead of uh, looking for jobs, and that also has resulted in a, in a, in a, in a, reduced, uh, in a reduced labor force, uh, which uh, somehow artificially uh, 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 reduces uh, numbers for, uh, for, for uh, uh, youth unemployment, because they are just out of the labor market to 
to train and to, and to be educated. So that's good in a sense, but uh, that has nothing, nothing much to do with the functioning of the labor market. It has all to do with preparing for, for future changes. And, and the last factor is about labor market institutions uh, where uh, there are factors which, are, which have nothing, to, nothing special to do with the, with the younger people, like for instance, uh, a declining role of trade unions across the board. That's something that we see everywhere. Uh, and uh, it's not specifically, uh, uh, it does not specifically impact uh, the unemployment among the youth. But you also have the rise of at atypical forms of unemployment. So short-term employment, um, uh, part-time employment, which, which have disproportionately uh, been used by the younger people. So flexible work, or you may want to call it pre precarious work, is something that is much more widespread ac across the young. For instance, just to give you a number, uh, the number of uh, young people which are part-time employed, in 2000, that was 18% of the labor force, uh, and in 2018, that was 33% of the labor force. So um, whenever jobs were created for the young people, th these were mostly flexible jobs, precarious jobs, um, uh, and a lot of them are involuntary, uh, uh, part-time or, or, uh, uh, or um, uh, short-term contracts. And that's another illustration here, where you see that the, uh, the share, and that you, you see something which is, which is, which is uh, specific to Europe here. Uh, if you compare the Eurozone, which is EA on the right, uh, OECD average, UK, Japan, U USA, you see that the share of temporary workers is really something that is special to Europe and that we don't see uh, as much in, uh, in the USA uh, or, uh, or in the UK uh, or in the OECD. So there is something going on here which has to do with, with new forms of labor uh, which uh, disproportionately uh, impacts uh, the, uh, the younger people. But all of, this, all, of, all of that is structural, so it doesn't have much to do with the euro or in that case even with macro policies. It's something that, is, that runs deeper uh, inside the labor market. So what can we do about it? Um, what are the implications for Europe? I would say two main implications. Um, first, Europe, meaning European institutions, uh, have to make a much more visible contribution to uh, sharing growth across generations to, to fight the kind of uh, unequal distribution of growth that, that I've uh, uh, illustrated with the previous slides. Um, and second, uh, we have to pay more attention to those that are left behind, uh, which are generally uh, the poorest people, the, pre the precariously employed, which are often also the young people, uh, for the reasons I've just, uh, I've just explained. And for that, we have to maximize employment opportunities, but also here, Europe can make a difference. So when it comes to the first point, which is how do we make a more visible, how do we share growth more equally across generations? It has a lot to do with education, obviously. And here, the numbers are not that good uh, in terms of uh, educational spending uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, spending on education has stagnated in Europe uh, in, in recent years, it's around 5% of GDP, and it's quite stable, even slightly declining. It is quite uh, dispersed, quite, quite heterogeneous across Europe. In Italy, I guess it's around 4% of GDP. In Denmark, it's 7% of GDP. So you can see that you can al already do more at national level. Uh, and uh, it's only 10% of total spending, which is spent on education. Um, and that's uh, probably a neglected dimension uh, of the discussion on public finances in Europe, which, which very often focuses on headline numbers for deficit, for debt, the 3%, 60%, stability pact, and so, and so on, which is also important. But the, uh, the composition of spending uh, is, is too often neglected. Uh, very few member states have fiscal space uh, to spend more, but all member states have space to spend better. Uh, and that also implies uh, increasing uh, education spending as a share of, uh, of, of total spending. And that's something that the European Commission has repeatedly told member states, which is not really being, being followed up. Uh, and and that, that lack, that insufficient spending, that gap in spending on education also explains, it goes, it goes a long way to explain uh, the lack of social mobility uh, in Europe. Uh, you may have seen these OECD studies on social mobility across the OECD, where the OECD uh, computes how long it takes uh, to move from the lower, say, the lower D side of the income distribution to the average uh, or to the median uh, of the income distribution based on the uh, historical patterns of, 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 uh, of, uh, of social mobility. 
And the average for the OECD is that it takes between four and five generations to move from the lower, from the bottom 10% to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the level of mean earnings. And for Italy, by the way, it's slightly worse. Not that much worse, but slightly worse, around five generations. And that has a lot to do with education. Um, and then, of course, uh, it's also about uh, investing in technology. And here you have, on, that, on the slide here, you see the numbers for R&D uh, spending across a number of, uh, of uh, regions. And you can see that Europe is not doing well. Europe is a dark blue line here, the, towards the bottom. Uh, China has catched up, interestingly, that's the yellow line. Uh, and you see that Europe is much, much uh, below uh, other regions. And that also has to do with the composition of public spending. So uh, very often the discussion on, uh, on, uh, on, um, on public finances should be more about the, the composition of spending than about the, the, headline, the headline numbers. Um, and finally, on my, last, on my last point, which is how do we, um, how can we pay more attention to those that are left behind by all these structural uh, transformations that we're seeing? Uh, here you can see that the young people in Europe are suffering uh, in a dispro disproportionate way from unemployment. This we've seen already, but that also correlates with the risk of poverty. So on, this on, on, that, on the slide here, you see the risk of poverty uh, at uh, EU 27 level. Um, again, according to generations, and you can see how much the, uh, the risk of poverty has increased for the younger people, mostly, I would say, as a result of higher unemployment across the, across the young. Uh, and so that has to do with um, um, improving on, uh, on opportunities uh, to, uh, to become employed, including, uh, at the, in particular, including at the lower end of the, of the skill, uh, of the skill uh, scale. And here there is something that, uh, that matters quite a lot, which is that the existing welfare systems have, been, have not been designed for to address that kind of situations. The design of the existing welfare systems across Europe uh, remain uh, tailored to traditional forms of employment. Uh, I've mentioned the rise of temporary contracts across the board, but also for the younger. Uh, it, uh, and that, of course, um, makes it difficult for, I mean, it's, it's Structurally difficult for when you are temporarily employed to uh, temporarily employed to uh, to get uh, uh, to become eligible for benefits. But even the eligibility uh, criteria are based on factors that have that benefit uh, older workers, um, such as the duration of an, of, of employment as a as a as a criterion to get eligible for benefits. That's something that uh, uh, benefits older workers uh, compared to uh, to younger workers. So we also need to think uh, uh, harder and maybe to, to rethink, to revamp our welfare systems to account for all these people who are now working in, uh, in atypical forms of employment, more flexible, more precarious forms of employment. Um, and that also, uh, of course, uh, speaks to the, the whole discussion on how to, uh, uh, how to revamp our welfare systems to account, to account for new uh, forms of work uh, related to, to new technologies like platforms, I mean, uh, Uber, uh, uh, Deliveroo, or whatever, uh, where uh, uh, being, uh, being legally uh, an, in an independent worker and not an employed uh, 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 wage earner, uh, you don't have the access to the same benefits. So we need to rethink. Uh, that's mostly at the national level, obviously, not at the EU level. But the EU can help in different ways. One way the EU can help is that uh, the EU can help um, protect our tax base to make it possible to support, redistribute, and support the, uh, those who are left behind on the labor market. And for instance, what the European Commission has started to uh, uh, fight uh, um, uh, corporate tax avoidance, to uh, use competition law, uh, what Margaret Vestager has done to use competition law to fight against tax avoidance uh, by uh, uh, large uh, uh, multinational corporates. That's something that eventually helps support the tax base and uh, protect the means, the financial means that we have to redistribute uh, and to, uh, to be more inclusive on the labor market. And there are also ways that the EU can spend more uh, at EU level to, to support the youth. So, for instance, we have an EU youth, so-called youth guarantee, which has been created in 2014, uh, which has uh, already created quite a lot of jobs at, uh, at EU level. So, um, 
That's mostly national, but it can be coordinated. There can be benchmarking, that can be good practices. And uh, there are some actions that are, will be uh, more effective at EU level, in particular the action to, uh, to fight uh, tax evasion and to, uh, and to protect our tax bases. So I, I've, I've just been trying to give a number of examples of what the EU can do. Uh, I've tried to answer the question that we had on the screen earlier on, which was, uh, what can Europe uh, do, for, do for you? So that's, these are examples of Europe can, can do for you. Uh, and then all the rest uh, is in your hands. And I stop here. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I can see here from, uh, uh, from Srida that, uh, you know, already a number of questions have, um, have come in, so uh, quite interesting. Uh, so I think we can start. Uh, so again, let, let me, let me uh, 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 welcome you again in, in uh, submitting your questions to Slido and to vote about other people's questions so that we can uh, project uh, 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 the most uh, like the questions, so let me go. Let me go by the rules. So let me let me start with the, with your questions. Actually, that the one on the top uh, now it seems to be about migration flows. Okay, and so uh, although it's it's hard to see a connection with the, with the, with the monetary policy, right? Uh, this question asks: so What are the CB views, if any, on the economic impact of migration flows into the European Union, if any? Well, uh, that's really not starting with the easiest question. Uh, I, have, I have to respect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. No, no. Uh, you, will, you will get credit for that. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, the ECB is doing monetary policy, right? So we don't have a normative view on, uh, on migration policy, and we have no competence uh, whatsoever when it comes to migration policy, uh, obviously. That said, migration is also an economic uh, an economic. Um, uh, fact, uh, and so we have to un first we have to understand what's going on, uh, and we have to to ponder the impact both in the short term and in the long term. So, for in just to give you an example, we spent some time uh, together with the Bundesbank colleagues uh, to understand the impact of uh, the huge uh, labor force shock, positive labor force shock in Germany, with all the migration coming into Germany. Uh, we had to understand the impact on uh, on wages. Uh, is that going to create more competition? Is that going to be an additional uh, dampening force uh, on, uh, uh, on wages, uh, on nominal wages in Germany? But for that, you have, you've got to understand the qualification level of the migrants, how far they're going to learn German, how far they're going to be trained, etc. So what we do is more trying to understand the consequences and also in the long term. Uh, I would say in the long term, that's something that has to be seen positively because uh, uh, I mentioned aging. Uh, the longer term prospect for the Eurozone labor force is to be shrinking, uh, to be in decline. Uh, so provided that the right training, skills, etc., is provided, uh, that's a, uh, uh, unambiguously a net positive in the long term. Uh, now, uh, it all depends how it's done in the short term. Uh, and in the short term, it can have an impact on monetary policy, as I said, because it, it can have a material impact on, uh, on wage developments. Let me remind all of you that you can actually raise questions directly. Huh? So, if you'd rather prefer to do it anonymously, so you have the, that's fine. You have the digital way and the analogic yeah. way. Yes, please. Can we give a mic? That's the old-fashioned way it's for, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you to be here today. Uh, my question would be, what are the monetary implications of aging in Europe? Well, it's a little bit the same um, answer, in a sense, uh, insofar as aging can be seen as a labor supply shock. Uh, it's a shock on the composition of labor supply. Uh, and uh, I guess the answer uh, is also the same uh, insofar as it's, it's really a kind of, uh, it depends kind of answer, because it depends a lot on how much uh, training, skills, technical change can make, make up for uh, the, uh, the loss of, uh, of, uh, of labor force uh, that comes with aging. So I think, and I don't have the answer. 
so you will be very disappointed, but it, I think it, it entirely depends on whether we can innovate enough to, uh, to, um, uh, to push up uh, TFP growth so that we can compensate the impact of aging, uh, which would be the Japanese model in a sense. Well, it might seem a little bit weird to see that uh, Europe has a Japanese model. Uh, I don't think J Japan is a, is a model in, uh, in, in that many dimensions. But uh, Japan has been successful in raising, uh, uh, in, 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 in innovating to make up for the, uh, for the impact of aging. And as you've seen, I mean, the figures I've, I've been trying to show you on these slides are not so positive in terms of our capacity so far in Europe to, to innovate, uh, to, to increase productivity, to, to make up for the impact. But, uh, but uh, the jury is out, so I don't want to have a definitive answer here. So, so let, let, me, let me pick the question that is now on top, because I guess that's a theme that uh, 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 so comes back very often in the debate surrounding the ECB policy, mm -hmm. right? And it has to do with, uh, you know, one monetary policy in many countries. Uh, so this question asks, the national economic situation in each country varies, and how is it possible to implement uh, one monetary policy for all? Well... I mean, clearly, you need, you need a number of preconditions for it to work. That is, you need, if you want to have a single monetary policy for, for very diverse regions, such as, uh, such as the Eurozone, uh, you need uh, elements of flexibility uh, in markets, labor market flexibility, capital market flexibility, so that you have the right adjustment mechanisms in the economy, right? So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm really doing optimal currency areas uh, 101, so uh, sorry for that, but uh, you, need, you need flexibility in the economy, you need um, fiscal policies that can deliver uh, adjustment at the national level, and this we haven't seen so much. We've seen fiscal policies being quite procyclical actually in, in countries, and, uh, and fiscal buffers not being built to the extent that would allow fiscal policy to be effective. And, and sorry to kind of move away from your question, but I think that's the, the, the core reason why uh, we have fiscal rules and the core reason why at the ECB we've been supportive of the stability pact and fiscal rules is that we, we do believe in fiscal policy, <laughs> in the usefulness of fiscal policy. If you want fiscal policy to be useful at the national level, you need fiscal buffers. You need to be able to use fiscal policy when you need it. Uh, and when, you're, when your public debt is already very high before the the, the negative shock hits the economy, then you're not in a position to use fiscal policy. It's too late. So that's why you, countries need to build fiscal buffers uh, if they want to be able to use fiscal policy. And it's an essential part of the functioning of a monetary union. Um, and then you need some amount of convergence. I mean, you, 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 need, you need countries not to, not to defer too much. And that's why, for instance, we've been supportive of this uh, new discussion uh, that uh, um, uh, member states are having in Brussels on having a, a, um, a fiscal capacity for the Eurozone, which would be focused on competitiveness and convergence, because we need more convergence, and uh, if there is some European money to be put on projects that can foster convergence across Eurozone members, that's something that will benefit monetary policy as well. So that, these are the preconditions. And then, and finally, monetary policy is single, we, the instruments are the same for all countries, obviously. We don't do differentiated monetary policy. But the um, impact of the instruments can differ across countries. So if you take some of the instruments that we've created in the crisis, take uh, the uh, long-term refinancing operations, LTROs, or the targeted long-term refinancing operations, TELTROs, as we call them. These are instruments which are the same for everyone. Any bank can access. Uh, in a, under the veil of ignorance, if you want to put it like that. But exposed, of course, access is, is different across countries. So these are instruments which are equal and accessible everywhere, but which have been accessed in different ways in different countries, and uh, depending on the needs of, the, of different economies. Uh, and that's something that we've learned in the crisis, that some instruments of monetary policy can be single ex ante, but uh, have different impacts exposed, and that has been very useful. Uh, yeah, before we go to, I uh, see, interesting questions on Italy coming up. But before we get there, I had a question related to the discussion on aging. Uh, so Japan and the euro area are 
in the world, the areas of aging population, fast and everywhere. But if you look at monetary policy, the inflation target is about 2% and has, been, has remained 2% uh, independently of the fact that aging has, has become a more serious problem. But at the same time, for many reasons, of course not only aging, both areas find it difficult to get inflation to 2%. Is the conclusion that there is a reason to rethink the target and relate it to the aging of population or is completely out? So you, you may find it hard to believe, Francesco, but we, we do believe that inflation in the long term is a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and so aging can have a huge impact in terms of relative prices and a lasting impact. And, a, and, a, and so that's something that we have to understand and factor in, in, in when we do monetary policy, of course. But uh, I don't think it should, uh, it should have an impact on the inflation uh, objective, which is a long term discussion. So let's let's throw let's throw the the big bomb here on, uh, on Italy that everybody's expecting, um, but we have to get there sooner or later. So uh, so the question asks whether you see Italy's economic situation as a threat for the eurozone. Uh, you know, just to put it very <laughs> blankly. So. Look. Uh, <laughs> so the answer is no. The answer is no. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, uh, Italy uh, has challenges. I mean, all countries have different challenges. Uh, Italy has a short-term challenge uh, uh, in so far as uh, Italy is the only, uh, so far, the only Eurozone member which is in a, technically in a recession. Because there have been two uh, consecutive uh, uh, num numbers of uh, um, releases of uh, negative GDP growth. It's a technical uh, recession. There is no reason why it would remain in a recession. Uh, growth is low, uh, la in, but for different reasons. One of them being um, financial conditions tightening, in particular long-term long yields uh, tightening because of uh, policy uncertainty. So that's specific to Italy, but it's a short-term discussion, right? Uh, so I think the, 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 the most important discussion is more on the long term. Uh, it's on how to create, uh, to create total factor productivity in, it, in Italy uh, in a way that can lift Italian growth uh, um, towards or, or even, even, even above uh, Eurozone average. And that's a discussion, by the way, that has nothing to do uh, with the EU or with Euro whatsoever, because the slowdown in uh, Italian total factor, productiv to total factor productiv productivity growth has started uh, before accession to the Euro, actually. Uh, so uh, that has to do with uh, better uh, leveraging the assets of the Italian economy and the, the productive strength of the Italian economy. So uh, that's not something on which the ECB can, can, can say much because that's about how to help uh, Italian companies export to global markets and how to, uh, to, uh, how to uh, leverage uh, on the comparative advantages of the Italian economy. So I think the right discussion is really on the long term, uh, strength of the Italian economy, not that much on the short term. Questions from the floor? Yes, please. Thank you. So, um, following that, the situation about the Italian economy, I would ask about another economy. We just recently had the growth forecast of the European Commission. Everybody shared that because Italy was like on the last place. But what scares me more is the second last place, which is Germany, and the uh, recent slowdown in a lot of key sectors to Germany, which namely the automotive sectors, the chemicals. Um, and then we heard just like two days ago that, we, that the interest will stay low, at least um, for this year and the next year, as far as I got that. Um, in case Germany would struggle, and I heard already there are like some hedge funds speculating on a German recession and so on. In case Germany would start to struggle by, let's say, the end of this year or next year, would that influence the decision making? Or would you say that Germany, since they have a lot of fiscal, <clears throat> let's say, a lot of things they can do on a fiscal basis, uh, should figure that out by themselves? So, um, well, of course, Germany does uh, influence our decision making. It's the largest economy in the Eurozone, so uh, uh, it does influence the, uh, the aggregate numbers in the Eurozone. Uh, when, we, uh, when we discussed uh, the economic outlook, uh, 
and, the, and when we uh, discussed our policy um, mix um, last week in the governing council, uh, Germany was part of that discussion. And I would say Germany, in a sense, is a case is, is a, is a, uh, is a, uh, a case in point of a, of a broader discussion, which is about the impact of global growth um, on the European economy. I mean, in our assessment, most of the slowdown uh, that we've seen recently in the Eurozone is due to global factors. Uh, is due to the slowdown in global trade. It's due to anxiety uh, created by trade tensions, trade frictions. I'm not calling that a tra trade war, because we always hope that there would be, that will, will be no such thing as a trade war. But there are trade discussions, obviously, trade uh, tensions. Uh, and these trade tensions have created anxiety globally. Uh, and they have uh, created, uh, they have raised questions on the sustainability of value chains globally, starting with, uh, by the way, with Eastern Asia and China, but also in Germany, which is uh, really at the heart of, of the global value chains. So Germany, in a sense, is a, is an example of how um, uncertainty over global trade and over the, the structure of, of, of global trade as we know it um, can uh, have an impact on growth. And being a la very large exporter, Germany is at the forefront of that discussion. Uh, so it has been impacted directly by, uh, by, by the global slowdown and that also is reflected in, uh, in, uh, in your zone uh, numbers. Uh, so, if anything, that also shows that uh, the German economy has been, re has been very reliant and one could say excessively reliant on, uh, on, uh, on global trade. Um, and that also re is reflected in, uh, in, the, uh, in the German current account surplus. So, we've been, we've, we've been I mean, the ECB has been in agreement with, say, the Commission, uh, when, the commi when the European Commission says, Germany has fiscal space. Uh, Germany has space to invest more for its own future um, in, uh, in areas which, are, which would be good for the future of the German economy. That's something we support and that would contribute to the rebalancing. And that would contribute to make German growth more resilient and less dependent on global shocks. Yes. First of all, thank you, Mr. Curé, for being here. My question is, could the ECB use its bond buying program as leverage to incentivize countries to implement fiscal reform? For example, if Italy were to suddenly massively increase its debt load, could the ECB lower its debt purchases as a punishment or as a leverage? Um, no, the answer is no. <laughs> Because we do monetary policy and we don't do fiscal policy. At Bocconi, we are very good in political economy, I guess, yeah. more than in monetary okay. policy. <laughs> it's a political economy motivated question. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, but it doesn't change the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is uh, we do monetary policy, so we do what's, uh, we do what's best to, uh, to fulfill a, our monetary policy mandate, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, bringing inflation back to, to close to 2%. Uh, and we've done it in a particular way, which is buying bonds. And we're still buying bonds, by the way, because lots of people say, that's not your question, but lots of people around say, uh, they've stopped QE. We haven't stopped QE. We are reinvesting uh, the, the, uh, the, the repayments, the principal repayments uh, um, uh, on the bonds we've purchased, and that's still quite substantial. It's, it's in the 20 billion euros per month that we're still buying on the, on your own capital market, so it's quite substantial. So reinvestment is, a, is, a, is an essential part of QE and it's still going on. Um, and it's part of our monetary policy. So we do it in a way uh, which we want to be uh, as neutral as possible in terms of political economy, right? So when it comes to private bonds, we do it in a market neutral way. That is, we buy roughly, I mean, quite, quite precisely actually, uh, in proportion to the market structure. When we buy corporate bonds, we buy in proportion to the market structure which also some people don't like because they say you buy too much of uh, carbon intensive uh, companies, etc., etc., and they have a point, but the point is we do monetary policy, so we want it to be neutral. And when we, do, when we buy government bonds, we buy, it, we buy according to the capital key of the ECB, and uh, from the start we've done that and we're not changing it. So uh, we don't want to, to pollute monetary policy with, uh, uh, by internalizing other policy objectives uh, which should be addressed by other institutions. So let fiscal policy be done by member states and by the European Commission. We don't have to do it. Yes. Uh, okay, let's see. 
Um, do you think that the gap existing in the employment rate between men and women and also uh, the gap between men and women employed in STEM subject is a limit for growth and how can and should you fix that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously, yes. Obviously, yes, it's a, li it's a limit to growth. I mean, that's not, that's not something that is, I mean, the, that's relatively far away from what the ECB does, right? Because we don't have any instrument that would speak to that discussion or we, it's not part of our mandate, etc. Now, uh, so that's something for the for member states and maybe for the commission to uh, to discuss. But it's a fact that if the uh, if women participation rate and also if women um, um, uh, compensation in terms of gender equality in, compens in compensations uh, would be if, if all of that would be fairer, that would uh, be good for uh, Europe and growth, and that would be good for uh, for for the standards of living in Europe. So even from our perspective, we, we would see it positively. Now we don't have the instruments. It's for the EU to, uh, to, uh, to do it. Um, and the IMF, as, as you may know, the IMF has done a lot about that. Christine Lagarde has been uh, kind of uh, pushing her staff to work on that in an effective way. Uh, and the IMF has, has produced very compelling studies on how gender uh, fairness or equality can, uh, can improve economic outcomes. So f mostly in, in emerging market economies, but also in advanced economies. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to turn to another subject, uh, the Brexit. So uh, yesterday the British Parliament uh, rejected for the second time the agreement proposed by the European Union. Uh, Michel Barnier said that no deal issue was more probable than, uh, than ever. And my question is, uh, how can Europe prepare itself for a no deal issue concerning the Brexit? Uh, can can uh, Europe prepare itself and uh, also uh, uh, what are the immediate um, impacts that we can expect in that scenario? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so on the, on the political underpinnings of that, of that discussion, I don't have much to say because that's, uh, that's a political discussion. And uh, I can only, only quote from what Michel Barnier said yesterday night. He tweeted, uh, the EU has done everything it can to help get the agreement over the line. The, imp the impasse, impasse can only be uh, solved in the UK. So that's what Michel Barnier said, and, uh, and uh, obviously I agree with that. But then he, he goes on saying, no deal preparation is more important than ever, which is your question. So we've been preparing for a no deal Brexit for, 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 for some time. Um, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time um, jointly with the Bank of England, by the way, which is important, uh, because we had to come to, to a joint assessment of the risks. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of time uh, in the second half of last year to map the risks uh, coming with a no-deal Brexit in the financial industry, obviously. There are many other risks which we don't, uh, which are f further away from what the ECB does, but we've done it for the financial industry. And at that, when we've reported to, the, um, to Her Majesty's Treasury and to the European Commission, which had commissioned that work, our conclusion was by and large, risks are well addressed in the financial sector by, by banks, by, by the financial industry themselves. Um, even, even though some more could be done, but it's by and large well prepared, except in one area, which is clearing, right? The clearing of, uh, of, uh, of derivatives and of, of swaps, where there is so much concentration in London that uh, discontinuity in the provision of clearing services would have uh, created major disruptions. And this has been since, so that was in November, and this has been addressed by the European Commission and by ESMA, uh, and they have granted equivalence uh, to uh, clearing services in London. So I think it's, and, and, and separately, our supervisory arm, the, the single supervisory mechanism, which is part of the ECB, uh, has spent a lot of time uh, discussing with uh, UK-based banks and uh, international banks to prepare for possible relocation in the Eurozone in terms of risk management, in terms of, uh, in terms of staff, to make sure that any relocation to the Eurozone would be, would be safe in terms of uh, uh, prudential standards uh, and would not, would not create risk for the Eurozone. And that has been done. So I, would, I think it's fair to conclude that the financial sector is probably one of the best prepared industries for, no, for a no deal Brexit because the preparation has started early on and because uh, uh, a lot of issues have been addressed and whatever was not done 
uh, could not be done uh, by the industry itself has been addressed also through, through regulatory uh, measures. So I would say that the main risks are outside of the financial industry as of today. First of all, is it a goal of the European Union to maybe expand the Eurozone into some other European Union countries like Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Croatia, and if so, what implications would this have on the rest of the Eurozone? So, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural process that the Eurozone uh, expands. And by the way, throughout the crisis, I mean, the, the Global, the great financial crisis started in 2007 or 2008, and then we had the Eurozone crisis. And throughout the crisis, the Eurozone has kept widening with new countries joining, like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania have joined uh, the Eurozone, and we are now 19 countries. And uh, as you know, legally, all countries are uh, bound to join the, the Euro eventually, except for two countries, the UK, which maybe may not be part of the EU next week anyway, uh, and, and Denmark, because they have a derogation. But for all countries, that's a relevant question. So uh, there is a process which is in the treaty, and the process is you've got to be part of the exchange rate mechanism for two years before joining the euro. So the kind of first question to ask is, are there countries that would be ready and willing to join the exchange rate mechanism? And we have, one such con so we have one country in the exchange rate mechanism, which is Denmark, but they don't want to join the euro, and they, and they have the right not to join the euro because it's, it's in the treaty. So it's entirely for them to decide. And then we have a second country which, have, which has expressed a will to join, which is Bulgaria. And so Bulgaria has officially sent a request, uh, and they are in a process whereby um, they are... Uh, expected to join the exchange rate mechanism by mid-19, roughly. And since they would be the first country to join the Eurozone after we've created banking union, which is really a new feature of, uh, of, uh, of the Eurozone, um, member states together with us and with the Commission have told the Bulgarians, it's fine, but if you want to join the exchange rate mechanism, you've got to be part of banking union, meaning you've got to enter into close cooperation with, with the ECB for uh, bank supervision, which the Bulgarians are preparing. So that's a process we have now, and it's only one country, Bulgaria. And so the Eurozone would come later anyway. Uh, so the short-term uh, milestone is uh, Bulgaria joining the exchange rate mechanism, which is expected around mid-19. Uh, um, what is your opinion on the low interest rates, and in how far do you think that low interest rates are preventing millennials and our generation um, to have safe and secure savings? Well, low interest rates are, are part of a policy which has, uh, which has been there to, uh, to restore growth in the Eurozone, ultimately to restore inflation and, 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 and to, 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 to achieve price stability, bringing inflation back to 2%. But that implies, essentially implies that uh, we support growth and we support job creation because that's the way prices can be uh, lifted up. Uh, and so low rates uh, are, are, part, are, are the, at the center of a policy which has supported job creation in Europe, uh, including, as I showed earlier in the slides, job creation for the young. Uh, so uh, if you want to save for your retirement, uh, it's good to, before you care about the uh, interest rate on your uh, savings. Uh, it's also good to have income in the first place, uh, that is to have a job, uh, and that's why rates are low. Uh, so that's really why we've, we've been doing it. Um, how would you compare the policy mixes that the Fed uses in the U.S. to the ones that the ECB uses here in the EU? So, sorry, but that's a very broad question, so we can spend like two hours on it. So, can you, can you specify a little bit, or? Yeah, um, when it comes most importantly to setting the proper interest rates in order to ensure proper, um, a high enough gr GDP growth to keep up with emerging economies such as India and China. So why then? 
so it's, it's even broader now. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the, the, there can be no direct comparison between, between monetary policies in different areas because we are so different, right? I mean, the, the ECB is essentially, essentially different because we are doing monetary policy for 19 countries with their own fiscal policies, their own social policies, their own structural policies, uh, etc. Also, we have a different mandate from the Fed, right? Uh, ECB mandate is primarily price stability, while the Fed has a dual mandate, as you know, uh, price stability and uh, uh, full employment. I don't think it makes a lot of difference today because today the, both objectives are essentially aligned, so it, we doesn't make such a difference, uh, but, uh, but still, for, legally, the mandate is different. Um, and, uh, and financial markets are extremely different. So, for instance, um, it has proven, we had, for instance, when we decided to do quantitative easing, we had to do it in a, substantial, in a very different way from the U.S., because we don't have private capital markets that are as deep as in the U.S. So when the, when the, when the, Fed, when the Federal Reserve has, has been doing uh, QE, they've been primar primarily buying mortgages, right? Um, we don't have a mortgage market that we could use in Europe. It doesn't, just doesn't exist uh, to the same extent. So we had to buy government bonds, and then we run into what Francesco would call political economy issues, such as how do we do it, uh, what's the breakdown of what we're buying, etc., um, which are issues that the Fed uh, doesn't have. Uh, I mean, it, would, it wouldn't cause the mind of the Fed to start buying municipal bonds or bonds issued by, uh, by states in the U.S. because there is a federal budget, a federal government, and so the natural safe assets, uh, liquid assets in the U.S. is, uh, is, uh, is uh, U.S. treasuries. Uh, we don't have that in Europe. So we had to cr invent to create something totally different. Uh, so uh, I, would, uh, I would guard any, any, against any, uh, any uh, direct comparison. Since, can I jump in? Yeah. Since there was a question on the US, let me raise another issue. Uh, the, a big discussion in the US today on monetary policy and probably one of the central issues of the campaign for the next presidential election is what is called MMT, the Modern Monetary Theory. Could you explain us how you understand what this thing is? And uh, because Octavia Cortez, the leading figure in the US Congress, will make of this the leading electoral campaign. Okay, so Francesco, that's not really kind to me because <laughs> what, whatever you say on MMT, uh, you start being trolled on Twitter, so <laughs> I've got to be prepared for that. Um, so uh, <laughs> I don't claim to be a specialist of MMT. Uh, what I understand from what I've read, I, I'm, so I may be totally wrong, I'm sure that I mean, within 10 minutes there will be people sending emails and tweets to tell me that I'm, I am totally wrong, actually, so we'll see. Uh, but what I understand from MMT is that there are two kind of basic premises, assumptions. First is, um, I mean, I see MMT as a theory of fiscal dominance, essentially, oh. while, of fiscal dominance, no? While what we do, the way, I mean, kind of mainstream, mainstream macro, and certainly the way legally we organize in Europe is, is around monetary dominance. No, so you want the government to be solvent, to be intertemporally solvent, to be to be uh, um, uh, to to have a, uh, a, budget, a balanced budget over time, and provided that the government budget is balanced over time, then you do monetary policy in, a, in an independent way. That's how we do it in Europe. That's what the uh, what underpins the Maastricht Treaty. And MMT kind of reverses the, uh, the assumption, saying uh, whatever can be achieved through fiscal policy should be achieved through fiscal policy, and monetary policy will adjust, because the interest rate is a policy variable, among other policy variables. It's not something different. So you don't have separation between fiscal policy and monetary policy the way we see it in Europe and the way it is legally enshrined in the, in the treaty. So uh, that's the first assumption, as I, as I understand it. And the second assumption is whenever you uh, issue bonds and you create money in your own currency, your sovereign currency, is going to be fine because you can issue as much sovereign currency as you, as you wish, provided that it's your own currency. So I think there are limits to both arguments. First, I don't think you can issue as much debt as you can without triggering inflation. And at some point, there will be inflation. And so that sets a limit to how much debt you can issue. So the notion that MMT can in a sense, give a free hand to fiscal policy because you, you would be able to fund anything. I don't think that's tr true in the real world. 
because ev eventually there would be inflation coming anyway. And second, the notion that you can issue as much currency as you want in your sovereign currency. I, don't, I also don't think that's true because you need someone to, to hold it. And even your own citizens at some point may want to hold foreign currency. And that's what we've seen in dollarized countries. Uh, when, you, when you're a dollarized country or euroized country and you have a, an unrealistic or unreasonable uh, domestic monetary policy or fiscal policy, citizens start using US dollars or they start, they start using euros. So that also sets a limit to how much you can print or issue in your own currency. So I think it's, it's, it's a good discussion to have because it challenges a kind of traditional way to look at fiscal policy and monetary policy, but I think there are severe uh, limitations to the, to the assumptions. And I would say eventually we have a legal framework in Europe which is uh, a separation between dichotomy between fiscal policy and monetary policy. And that, that was uh, decided uh, by, by European citizens in a treaty. So we're not going to change it. No, no, ask. Uh, but I'm picking from the, from the list. Um, so the key word is populism. I don't fully understand the, the logical connection, but still I'm going to ask the question and pose the question because it's, it's an argument that, uh, that I hear a lot. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an argument about you know, unconventional policies that the ECB followed after the Great Recession and the rise of populism. So do you see any connection between the ECB policy in the aftermath of the recession and the alleged rise of populism? This relationship, I, I think the, the question hints to the role of QE, uh, QE and the banking system, the ECB. Uh, so uh, again, I, this is an argument that uh, in a sort of unstructured way you, you, you hear a lot, especially you know, on, on social media. So. I would. I mean, first, I mean, I, I, I myself, I don't want to use, I mean, words such as populism too much because that's politics, and we ECB is not a political institution, so we take politics as they as they come in a sense. So uh, we, uh, I don't want to pass uh, value judgments on, on 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 politics because that's not my job. But then, to your question, I would say that's what uh, econometricians would call a, would call a spurious correlation. No, so both unconventional monetary policies and populism or anti-European anti, anti feelings or uh, 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 anti-institutional uh, uh, feelings are, are uh, uh, consequences of the same cause. And the same cause is a, a crisis that has uh, inflicted a lot of damage on the economic uh, fabric and on the social fabric. And so we had to react to it using monetary policy instruments and uh, it takes time. People are upset, there, are, there is a lot of anger because of the outcome of the crisis, which you can understand. And maybe also uh, there is a lack of uh, economic literacy, I would say, in some places, where people focus on uh, partial equilibrium and they forget about or they overlook general equilibrium. So yes, monetary policy today implies low rates which have an impact on savers. That's a fact, of course. But monetar monetary policy also supports aggregate demand uh, has uh, uh, supported uh, job creation and has helped reduce unemployment. But that's a general equilibrium mechanism which is uh, much more difficult to understand. Huh? You, re you know this famous, uh, the famous book by Frédéric Bastia, uh, so, uh, 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 19th century French economist who wrote a book called Ce qu'on voit et ce qu'on ne voit pas. So what you see is partial equilibrium, what you don't see is general equilibrium. And the difficulty, the core difficulty in explaining monetary policy is that people see the, the, direct, the, the partial equilibrium and they don't see the general equilibrium. Uh, some questions? Yes. Oh, okay, let's do this because it's, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. Um, don't you think that um, the assumption about modern monetary policy that uh, you have just explained to us may hold in the case of uh, US because it's a leading economy and because of that uh, um, benefits uh, from uh, a high level of trust. Yeah, that, that may be the case, and, but again, I don't claim to be a specialist of, uh, modern, of modern monetary theory, so I am just, just uh, answering in a superficial way based off what I've uh, uh, read, which, is, which may not be all of it, and, uh, and indeed, from what I've read, I see a lot of U.S. centricism, 
a lot of US, uh, US, uh, US biases. And by the way, there is a broader discussion which doesn't, which doesn't, which doesn't require MMT, <laughs> which is about uh, uh, the new, having a, the new discussion that you see emerging on fiscal policy and, you know, there being more space for fiscal policy because interest rates are low. And Olivier Blanchard started that discussion in his presidential address uh, at the uh, American Economic Association, etc. And that has nothing to do with MMT because you don't need MMT to make the point that uh, uh, R, R is lower than G, which is, I guess, a much simpler point. Uh, but there is also a lot of US centricism in that discussion. It is a fact that interest rates are lower uh, the, uh, than the growth rate in the US, and they've been lower for some time, and they will, re will remain lower for, for a lot of time. Uh, but it's not true everywhere. And uh, in many places in Europe, including in Italy, uh, I don't think you can safely assume that uh, interest rates will uh, um, uh, are or will be lower than the, uh, than the growth rate to the extent that they will allow uh, more fiscal policy. So um, even though it has become less likely to happen, thanks to the OMT program and the presence of the ESM, um, is there any like emergency plan or how would ECB react in case of a Eurozone country's default? <clears throat> Look, that's, that's exactly the kind of question that central bankers don't like because we don't comment on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, we don't comment on contingency scenarios, right? Uh, we have to be prepared for contingency, but we don't comment on it because, because that's, not a, uh, that's not a relevant question today. I mean, I don't see any, any Eurozone country today being on the verge of, uh, of default. So, uh, so uh, I'm just explaining to you why I'm not answering. Uh, can I follow? Uh, you, you just said that in the discussion about uh, real interest rate being exceptionally low, and mm -hmm. uh, as uh, you will learn in your macro course, if R is below G, the more that you have, the better off you are. And you said in some kind, but let me read to you uh, a tweet that uh, Olivier Blanchard uh, issued, I, I guess, Sunday. He says, on R minus G, there are some striking statistics on the IMF fiscal monitor, which is the publication of the IMF. Forecast of the of R minus G over 2018-2023, negative for 29 of, out of 34 advanced countries, negative for 33 out of 39 emerging market and middle income countries. So this seems to be, at least according to the IMF, a very widespread phenomenon. That mm -hmm. We should not worry about that. No, it is a widespread phenomenon that, uh, that R is lower than G. Widespread, but not uh, universal, um, as I said, uh, and um, and so I mean I mean I think I think I mean uh, Olivier makes a lot of good points. I think and he, he has a perfectly reasonable and, and a kind of balanced way to, to to raise the issue. So I'm not taking issues as, at at, uh, at 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 him. I'm just saying first you need you need to assume that R will remain lower than G for for an extended period of time in all these countries, which which. I don't know, so maybe that's what the IMF fiscal monitor says. But uh, and second, there is clearly a difference between the uh, the, the rates of uh, the rate the, the rate at which in governments fund themselves, that is the rate of issuance on government bonds, and the rate of return on the projects they would invest in. Right. So uh, I think that kind of misses an important part and. In my view, the most important part of the discussion, which is how are you, how, how are you going to spend the money, and that I tried to kind of give some examples here in my presentation. And uh, <coughs> your funding rate may be low. You've got to identify projects where the, the social rate of return is uh, is uh, is positive. And I've got to tell you from my experience, you as you remind, I mean, you you introduced me earlier on, saying I spent some time in the French mm -hmm. Treasury. And at some point, my job was to coordinate economic studies in Treasury, which included uh, doing, I mean, computing the uh, social rate of return for a lot of public projects. And that was very often negative. I mean, there are lots of investment projects which actually are not worthwhile uh, socially, uh, and which are vastly overestimated by th because of vested interests and, uh, and, 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 and lobbies. So, I think Olivier is factually correct, but then you've got to use the money in a way that is good for, for social welfare, which is easier said than done. Okay. Uh, 
mean, I, I love to see the also very technical questions come in. So, uh, so a question asks whether it, it's possible in a cashless economy. So uh, let's remind ourselves that we are far away from being in a cashless economy, but that, that's an argument that a lot of economists and monetary economists discuss about, to have a, a lower than zero policy rate and which, which implications would that have? So do you think that that would make the, the life of monetary policy easier or not? So by allowing more easily for interest rates to go negative. So yeah, so the easy answer is uh, we are not a cashless economy and still we do have negative rates, right? <laughs> so that's the answer in a sense. You don't need to, you don't need a cashless economy to have negative rates. Uh, our, the rate on our deposit facility, which is our main policy rate today, because that's what drives money market rates, uh, is minus 0.4%. Uh, uh, and we're clearly not in a cashless economy. So the, the kind of natural limit to, to nominal rates is lower than zero. Because it's, and you know the discussion, it's about the, the, <coughs> the cost of hoarding cash. Uh, the cost of buying safes to hold banknotes, uh, etc., uh, which, which kind of creates a wedge between zero and the how far you can go. And then you have an economic limit to how far you can go. I mean, Marcus Brunner Meyer at Princeton has written a paper on what he calls a reversal rate, which is a rate at which um, having negative rates starts being negative in terms of monetary policy transmission because it's bad for banks, right? Banks earn money on the difference between the short-term rate and the long-term rate. So if you have a very flat and negative yield curve, uh, that's bad for banks. And at some point, it's also bad for monetary policy transmission. So according to that line of thinking, you have a reversal rate. That is, you have a limit to how much rates can go negative uh, for economic reasons. And that has nothing to do with being cashless or, or, or not cashless. Right? So, it's, so, so cash is not the only part of the discussion. Um, but for me, the real answer is means of payments have to be driven by social demand. So there are countries where the use of cash is collapsing, like Sweden. Uh, maybe China is not so far from that. Countries where the use of mobile payments and, uh, and uh, um, um, uh, uh, payment on direct payment on social networks and the like uh, is, uh, is expanding very fastly. Um, and there are countries where it's not happening. So by and large in the Eurozone it is not happening and we still see strong demand for cash for banknotes. So that has, for me, cash are such an essential part of, uh, of, of trust in the currency that that discussion has to be driven by, uh, by social demand. So when we'll see uh, demand for cash collapsing in the Eurozone, then we'll have to think about uh, having, issuing a digital uh, a central bank currency and the like. But uh, it has to be uh, driven by, by what society wants. That's not something that has to be forced by central banks for the, for the purpose of doing monetary policy. Yeah, it's too important. Um, uh, you know, talking about cashless economies, uh, the, I think also the, the experiment that we saw in India, right, uh, where uh, some banknotes were uh, uh, unexpectedly taken off the market uh, uh, actually uh, generated uh, a lot of negative real effects. And so mm -hmm. also talking about going towards the cashless economy is something that should be taken for, with, with care. Uh, of course, the, the Indian economy is different from uh, Sweden, right? But as, as you're saying, yeah. uh, some countries, including Italy, right, they still use a lot of cash. And so making the transition towards the cashless economy should be actually very, very uh, uh, slow. Um, some questions? Okay. Yes? So right now there are certain countries outside of the Eurozone that still make purchases in Euros because of the price stability. And we have countries like Montenegro who aren't in the Eurozone, but uh, they use only the Euro. What difficulties does that pose in the implementation of monetary policy? I think the difficulty is more for them than for us. Uh, that is, uh, the, uh, those countries are not large enough that they would really become a... Uh, a big issue for, uh, for uh, monetary policy in the Eurozone. Uh, 
Now, Euroization in, uh, in countries which do not belong to the Euro can be an issue with, uh, for instance, it has been an issue in terms of uh, uh, financial stability in some countries where you've seen a lot of Euro borrowing uh, by households uh, or borrowing in foreign currency generally by households, which, which creates currency mismatch on the balance sheet of banks. And that has been an issue for banks in these countries. Um, and we've, our, our policy generally has, has been to encourage countries, neighboring countries, not belonging to the Eurozone, uh, to, to um, support the use of their domestic currency uh, and to disincentivize the use of the Euro uh, to, uh, to limit currency mismatches in their economies. Uh, and also because eventually they are, lending, they are lenders of last resort in their currencies, not in Euros, right? So, it, so I think the financial stability argument goes towards uh, encouraging the use of local currency, not, uh, not the Euro. But that's an issue for them. Uh, we don't see it as a major issue for the, the conduct of, 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 of monetary policy in the Eurozone, uh, because it's not that big. Yes, please. Um, sorry, you have already talked about the differences between the Federal Reserve System and the Euro system. Um, what are the restrictions that you would like to see fall first, if you could decide on that? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of it in terms of restrictions. I mean, we uh, uh, we have a we have a monetary union in Europe, which has been, whose the main features of which have been decided back in 1992, right, in the Maastricht Treaty, based on a uh, on what was the best compromise among European countries, uh, and that's what allowed the Maastricht Treaty to be uh, agreed and voted, uh, and the uh, uh, and the uh, single currency to start. So it's a contract. Uh, so uh, the way we work reflects a contract between different visions, sensitivities, uh, traditions uh, in Europe. Uh, and we've been doing monetary policy in a way that kind of uh, synth synthesizes uh, all these uh, different views. And by the way, one of the, one of the reasons we have a governing council uh, in the ECB uh, with 19 governors, 19 national governors and six board members uh, based in Frankfurt, uh, and all these 25 people doing monetary policy, is that we want to, to aggregate uh, these different views, this uh, heterogeneity of preferences that we have in Europe is being aggregated through the governing council uh, to, uh, to build consensus. Um, so that's, that's how we are, that's what we are. Uh, so I don't see it in terms of, uh, of uh, restrictions. Uh, and then the, the ECB mandate and the way the monetary union is organized, it's a political discussion. Uh, it's reflected in a treaty, in regulations, uh, which are voted by parliaments. So in a sense, I'm the last to have an opinion on it. I, I take whatever the European people tell me to give me and tell me to do. That's what we do. Last question here. I think you have one question, because <laughs> you have another four minutes. <laughs> okay, so maybe yeah. one last question. Yeah. You have a mic? Coming, coming. Uh, good evening, Mr. Curry. So, um, even if the quantitative easing program has been uh, has revived investment, uh, the, stock, the stock market has been very volatile in that period, and for instance, is falling since more than two weeks. And many media are talking about a coming crisis in the next future because of too high debt, complexity of financial tools and derivatives. So could a financial crisis happen again? And do you think the European Union is ready uh, if another big crisis happens? <coughs> it's very broad. But... So we're, we're ending on a gloomy note. <laughs> but yes, financial crisis will happen. Uh, I think it would be a delusion to believe that financial crises don't happen. Um, financial crisis uh, always happen. I mean, you may have read this uh, Kindleberger book on financial crisis since, uh, uh, since the 17th century or even earlier. And, uh, and crises are a feature of finance because finance is about risk taking. So uh, uh, it, uh, it uh, inevitably lead, leads to crisis. Uh, so, the, so the whole point is trying to uh, first trying to identify what can be the um, where where the next crisis can orig originate. And obviously it will come from a different place than the last crisis. So the last crisis was about subprime mortgages and uh, 
um, and uh, the originate to distribute model in, uh, in, uh, in securitized products and the like. And also the last crisis was about banks having too little capital and too little liquidity. And this, I would say, has been fixed. Uh, securitization is much less uh, opaque and uh, complex than it used to be, and banks are much better capitalized and much more liquid than they used to be. And that's an achievement. But it all, it all only means that the next crisis will come from a different place. Uh, and so in terms of the kind of uh, uh, flashing lights on the, on the dashboard uh, or the area where we should be very careful, I would identify two of them. First is non-bank finance. That is what used to be called shadow banking. Uh, so the, the, the Financial Stability Board took a big decision that we're not calling it shadow banking anymore. We're calling it non-bank financial intermediation. So that's a big step forward. Uh, but most of the issues remain to be fixed, right? Uh, and that's about um, all forms of lending that are, that are performed by non-banks, so money market funds, investment funds, uh, uh, asset managers, etc., where we don't have the same rules in terms of liquidity mismatch or uh, the same uh, kind of uh, uh, intrusiveness of regulation than, than in banks. Uh, and that's an area of, uh, of, of not concern, but attention. And the second I would flag is cyber risk, uh, where the financial sector is, uh, is, is uh, particularly vulnerable to cyber risk. Uh, either individual, individual institutions or globally financial infrastructures. We see a lot of fraud, a lot of cyber attacks against financial infrastructures. So we're working on it. Uh, we now have global uh, standards. We're working a lot with the industry, uh, but that's for me the major area where the, uh, the next crisis could, could come from. <laughs> Provided you're fast. <laughs> So, um, how long can a system such as uh, Target 2 be sustainable given a persistent ne negative current account of uh, peripheral countries? Well, Target 2 is a, target two is a, is a, uh, it's a thermometer, right? It's just an indicator of uh, underlying, uh, underlying financial flows inside the Eurozone. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a problem per se, it's an accounting <coughs> device. Uh, so there can be no, uh, uh, no, no, uh, no, no issue that could directly come from Target 2. It is a good indicator of underlying, underlying issues. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's worth being followed, uh, but uh, as it, just as, a, uh, as an indicator or as, as an accounting device. And, and actually, as a matter of fact, what, we, what we've seen in terms of target two imbalances is a big uh, increase in target two imbalances, so surpluses and deficits, uh, driven by quantitative easing, because we are buying a lot of bonds uh, which are being purchased from, say, non-Eurozone institutions, institutions based in London. These bonds are being settled in core European countries. So whenever, say, the Banca d'Italia buys a BTP under QE uh, from a, a bank in London, uh, typically the bank in London will have an account in Frankfurt, and so the, the money will go to Frankfurt, uh, even though it's being purchased by the Banca d'Italia. And that in itself mechanically uh, drives a wedge between the target to uh, a surplus of Germany and the target to deficit of, of Italy. So that has, that has been a big driver of target to imbalances um, until we've uh, stabilized QE uh, we've stopped uh, net increases in QE uh, in December. And uh, what we see now is target two balances being quite stable. Okay. Uh, so before closing and thanking uh, Benoit for this very unusual, uh, I want to make one observation that, that uh, I was in a high school uh, in Milan a few weeks ago with a debate on economics, finance, and there was not a single question on the euro. And the uh, question about banks, they were asking me, how can we uh, run a society without banks? We can, can we kill all the bankers? And, uh, but no, and then I went to a uh, young student, a girl, in the she must have been 15, in the front row, and I asked, we've been here two hours discussing finance and not a single question on the euro. So she looked at me and said, professor, do you want us to use the dollar? think when she was born. So maybe you're too old for this. So uh, this has been, in my view, a very unusual evening. It is very unusual, first of all, to have 
such an open and sincere dialogue with a member of the executive board of the ECB, uh, they usually do two things. Either they, they deliver prepared speeches, which are prepared speeches, or they have press conferences, but I think it's very rare, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, to have an open discussion with students open to questions, both from this room and coming from the outside. So I think is a, uh, I mean, at least for Bocconi, for Bocconi students, this has been a unique experience, and we'd like to thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks to you.